Schindler has a chance to write his name in Huddersfield Town legend. And he takes that chance! Welcome to episode four of the Andy Takes That Chance podcast. After a pilgrimage to the potteries, we have Cossie back in the hot seat alongside fellow League Cup sufferer Neil. And to add a little bit of elocution and quality to three gruff Yorkshiremen, we have podcast debutante Reese Dinsdale. Good evening, chaps. Good evening. Hello. So then, last week uh, when we did the Man City podcast, we said difficult times to do a podcast and be positive. Um... It's not got much easier, let's be honest. So we've, we've had Huddersfield Town nil, Cardiff nil. Positive is that it's the first point on the board, but performance-wise? First point on the board, not going to go down as one of the all-time greats, that is for sure. Um, pretty grim game. Town started OK, first 15, 20 minutes, a little bit more intent. I think the thing that stumped it for me was trying to combat Cardiff rather than concentrate on ourselves after the first two games. So, yeah, we're lined up in a 4-3-3, which is a bit unusual for us. Um, Billing, Moy and Hogg across the midfield three. And it seemed a little bit of a case of trying to match them up maybe with, with Billing in there because of his height and Cardiff being, being really good at set pieces and, and being a set piece side. It, it, there was a little element that it felt like maybe we'd match them up, but we wanted to be, the, you know, wanted to impose ourselves still. But it didn't quite work for us. I think we missed a trick not playing Pritchard. His little is tricky. And I think up against the two big lads that are there at the back, I think they're quite happy for time to try and knock something into Mooney and what have you. Because you know, Morrison's a big lad. Bamber alongside him, big lad. They want aerial threats. That's what they're good at. But I think with Pritchard, might have made a little bit of difference. Yeah, I agree. I was quite stunned, to be honest, that he wasn't involved. Uh, he's got a low sense of gravity. I saw it again on Stoke on, on Tuesday night. Uh, you know, he, he runs direct. You, you might get a penalty. You might, you know, get something there. Defenders don't want to, you know, kind of tackle like, you know, guys like Pritchard. And yeah, I was really shocked and disappointed, really, that he wasn't involved. I agree. I think, um, you know, Moy and Billing ended up being much of a muchness, really. And we tried to uh, shove Moy forward. So we lost what Moy does better, which is in that kind of number eight position by shoving forward. And then he didn't quite get forward. So the link between midfield and Mounier, say, was missing uh, there. We just needed movement in and around the box. And we didn't have anything like that at all. It was really shocking. I think Moy worries me a little bit at the moment. I don't know if he's got kind of World Cup hiatus. I know there's a few players that have come out of the World Cup that seem low on gas and he was on a bench on Tuesday, but to me it just looks lacks a yard. I always think Huddersfield Town, when Alan Moy plays well, we play well. And yeah, it, it is a bit of a worry. We tried to, you know, to, to put him a bit further forward on Saturday, but it didn't happen. And uh, it does worry me that we don't seem to play well unless Moy plays well. So looking across social media, one of the main issues appears to be our paucity of chances. Um, we're looking at this and maybe thinking maybe this is system related maybe it's confidence maybe it's a lack of bravery on the ball so it's in terms of stats um what i've you know had a quick glance over and for me it doesn't look like this is a new thing so in terms of when we were promoted we were promoted with the second lowest amount of goals scored in the top half of the championship and even forest in 21st one above relegation scored six more than us it, it wasn't a worry then because all's well that ends well uh, the poor return last season we failed to score in 20 out of 38 games in the Premier League uh, but we did win 4-1 twice so that's, that's a positive but since the last time we won 4-1 against Bournemouth which was one of the best performances of the season um, for me we seem to tighten up as a team not in terms of the system or the compactness but in terms of bravery in terms of expressing ourselves in terms of getting forward so just a few things so the last seven games our last seven home games is we've scored one goal we, so that's Town nil, Swansea nil, Town nil, Palace 2 Town 1 Watford nil, which is the last minute goal with Tom Ince uh, Town nil, Everton 2 Town nil, Arsenal 1 Town nil, Chelsea 3 and Town nil, Cardiff nil. in terms of creating chances Town nil, Swansea nil. we've had four shots on target Palace two shots on target Watford one shot on target which we scored from Everton two shots on target, Arsenal three, Chelsea one shot on target, and Cardiff one shot on target. Quite damning stats there. Um, Do you think they tell a full story though? Maybe no. 
Not at all, no. I think you've got to look at the teams that have come up against. Palace were buzzing. Everton were relaxed. Swansea came. I think the worst thing that happened in that Swansea game was the fact we had a man, they had a man sent off early. And it was just literally 10 men parked in a line. Um, and town weren't quite clever enough. Similar again last week, although obviously the red card was the other way around with Hogg getting sent off. We just look... <laughs> The, the one thing that's missing for me is the sort of intensity that we, that we used to play with. That's seemed to have drifted away a little bit. Reasons why, honestly don't know. Can't put my finger on it. Maybe it's lack of continuity with players. Maybe it's been a little bit worried about the opposition. But I think it's come to the stage now for me where we've got to stop worrying about the other teams and start imposing ourselves on them. Dia Carbian and Benza, both quick lads. Van La Parra, tricky. You know... Let's give them ball. Let's give them something to run on. Let's get let's let the other team worry about us a little bit more. I think that's half the problem for me. I mean, you knew on Tuesday, Neil, that one still could scored. That was it. The game was done. Yeah, we had mitigating circumstances on Saturday, but Wagner was said they're sending off chains the game. But I thought there was no evidence at all that we were going to go on to win the game. We might have done. Who knows if something had dropped? But no. And you know, the first two games, I don't, I don't really you know take much notice because we were the opposition. But to me, it's that excitement factor. You, you want something to cling on to. You want wingers to be beaten, full backs. You want stuff flashing across the box. Them stats you'd read out there might are really damning. And I think one of the reasons the frustration's kind of creeping in on the fans. I don't. To me, I don't think it's it is all down to results. It's more just what we're seeing with his eyes. It's not exciting enough for me, and the creativity is just non-existent. What's worrying as well is that we all complained last season that we weren't feeding our two strikers, not that they play together, but De Poitre and Mounier, uh, with enough uh, decent crosses into the box. So the beginning of this season has shown me that we haven't improved on that as of yet. So let's, give the, let's give them time. But so far... Had a Janai who has a decent cross on him. He hasn't provided the, the, the boards to, to, for them to feed on. Um, the two wingers, one of them, and Benza, bless me, hasn't had enough time yet, so it's not fair to, to judge him. Uh, I like the look of Dear Carby, but as yet, I'm not seeing that we're getting you know tons and tons of quality balls into the box, whether it be from our wing backs, full backs, or wingers. Um, that's a little worrying. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Reese. Um, so for me, the the problem seems to be that during the running last year, we we've obviously things get nervous, don't they? And we, we've tightened up a little bit in terms of um, body language. You know, we, mm -hmm. we we seem to have gone into safety mode. Um, everything's very safe. Every pass is very safe, and possession is almost sacred. You know, we we must keep the ball. And for me, I think part of that is there's a lack of risk. Yes, it's a risk versus reward. And for me, the, the main problem is that we've gone full safety and it, and it's really a case of learning from experience because there are a lot of games where we look back last year, Arsenal away, Spurs at home, where we've been we've been ripped through. And, and the main problem for me is the lack of speed in the middle of the pitch. So what happens if we commit a midfielder forward whereby we've seen the reward of that. We, we talk about risk and reward. We've seen the reward away at Watford where Aaron Moyes popped up in the box twice. Uh, and he's ended up scoring uh, and he's also got the penalty in that game as well but in terms of not taking a risk at the moment what we're also seeing is that when they do go forward if the pass isn't right you know we talked about the crossing from Hadij and I if the cross isn't right and if the, that ball's not perfect and, and one thing as well to point out is that we, we're very shy on committing people into the box for those crosses so even mm. if Hadij and I's crossing percentage is pretty low He's got one striker to aim for amongst five defenders, and it's very easy to go front and back on Mounier. And Mounier's movement's pretty good, but if if he's front and back and he's boxed in, he's, it's easier to defend. Well, in, in the Cardiff game, we had one attempt on goal, and that was the one time that the one cross got to Mounier. I wonder if we're victims of the fixture list as well. Why we haven't been so on the front foot is that if we've looked at those two fixtures and gone Chelsea, Manchester City, and he's planned to. You know, maybe some to put a block on there and not be on the front foot. Are we? Have we? Because we got hammered at Man City, are we now finding it difficult to get out? I mean, I do have something to say that will go against everybody's uh, thoughts about the beginning of the Cardiff match. We might hold it back, but uh, okay, I'll say it now. Uh, this is weird, and you all disagree. But I watched us for the first four or five minutes of that Cardiff game before that injury. We were on the front foot. We had all the ball. We were pinging passes about. People, The movement was good and we were in the groove. We And I turned to my son and I went, we're playing. We're playing. We're doing okay here. The injury comes. It's five or six minutes. 
Warnock gets at his players, starts having a chat with them. Yeah. We come off it, we, we start again, and it, it just doesn't fall to pieces, but it's a different tempo. And it, I'm not, look, what it was is what it was. But if it hadn't happened, you, don't, you just don't know what that game could have turned out to be. So maybe we're jumping too soon with um, you know, the, the problems we're facing. I don't know. I had the same conversation sat with my dad at Cardiff game. First five, six, seven minutes until the injury, we were on the front foot. And I said to my dad, if we get one here, these are the type, kind of team that you really can get at and get another because they'll struggle. They haven't scored a goal yet up until that point. But we just, we, we never really grasped it. As soon as the keeper went injured, after that, it just sort of dwindled. It was strange. I I actually thought the sending off might help us. I really did. I I thought the game was going nowhere. We, we were just drifting out to a nil-nil. Didn't agree with the manager thinking, you know, it changed the game. I, I thought, right, this might be interesting because they're going to come forward and we, you know, might catch them on the break with a bit of pace. But, wow, they did come forward and if we're being too brutally honest, they should have walked away with their points right behind that Sean Morrison header. Can't believe it sailed past the post. But, yeah, it, it was so frustrating because, like you said, Reese, we I agreed with you. I rung on radio. He said the first fifteen, the first seven or sorry eight or ten minutes before the you know Hamer injury, that, that we were really you know on it, and and then it just disintegrated. And yeah, we never but got it back. Then it should have lost. Like proper town. I, I hate to disagree with you a little bit because uh, in in the I thought we were slightly building up ahead of steam just before the sending off. I remember right in front of me, Congolo getting in a beautiful cross to, to Mounier. Oh, the header was fine, but it was an easy save in a funny way for the keeper. He, he could have put it across him or down. But I just felt we were just starting to get into the groove slightly, having not played terribly well in the first half. I, I thought the sending off was daft, was silly, and did affect the game. You know, there you go. It's just opinions, I guess, but... No, I, I can see that. I thought until the sending off, Huddersfield were the better team. And I think if anybody looked likely to score, it was going to be us. Because you could see Cardiff were under pressure because they were doing the old Simon Grayson trick where they were just hitting the ball down the line into the corner, trying to turn us round. They weren't very good, let's be honest. No, I do think the fixture list, the reason makes a good point there, because I think that's totally the difference from last year to this. Obviously, we seem to have some kind of fixtures. So after this tough start, I think a lot of people was building up, you know, we should be beating teams like Cardiff. I think for the first time ever, this would have a game that we were expected to win in the Premier League. And he never, you know, kind of panned out like that. And I think some of the frustration that you've seen, I think people, I don't know whether they were a coupon, uh, you know, kind of busted or what have you, but it was like, we're going to win this game and when I walked out were quite funny some of the Cardiff guys on the buses they jumped off and said lads says we haven't scored a goal well, they have now but you know you've scored one goal and we'll see you in the championship next year and if and you were watching that it'd have been hard to argue really because it was dire there's, um, there's one thing just picking up on one thing you've said there and the last two years we've had we should be beating the likes of Huddersfield Town and maybe we're a victim of, of something that we've been a victim of and Everybody put a lot on the Cardiff game. And again, we've frozen a little bit. Um, I don't think we played terribly. It came from the club as well, though, that as mm. well. The, the build-up and the, the season starts now. and Yeah. It didn't. If we're being brutally honest, it started against Chelsea. We, we get the reasoning behind saying it started against Cardiff. But I think we're just building up probably a little bit too far. Pota- yeah, potentially there's, there's too much. Have. And again, it's a, a point of that there are no easy games we, we've proven over the last two years there are no easy games if the other team turn up and Neil Warnock's a very clever guy and he will be having them scrap him from the very first minute of every game I mean I, I put a word of warning out on, on, on Twitter about that because I Warnock will have will have marked that down that game as one of his games that he has to do something in and I just said, anybody who feels that we're going to go there and we're going to walk over Cardiff, think again, because this was going to be a battle. It's going to be ugly from the start with, with the way he, he sets his teams up, the way they play. That's why I was excited in those first five minutes that I thought we can beat this by playing football. Um, but it was always going to be a battle. And um, so I think it, so what, it what happened in the end when Hoggy got sent off, we have to look at it as a good point. Um, there's no other way of looking at that I mean yes it, we wish, wish he hadn't done it but he did do it and so in the end we got a point out of that game. Like, like Cosy said as well that they could have scored on a couple of occasions and Danny Ward had a chance never thought I'd say Danny Ward in Premier League to be honest um, Sean Morrison should have scored so 
Yeah, when you look at the as a whole, it's a good point. Yeah, I think the upshot is Cardiff in the last half hour should have won that game. So any point we've got from a game we shouldn't have won, which is which is rare for us because yeah. we usually scrap and deserve yeah, everything we get. It's not all doom and gloom. Was it the right thing to do though? Just put the drawbridge at. Who knows? That could be the point that keeps us up. You know, obviously a long way to go. But I was just wondering. I mean, you're a tacticians to me. I just wondering if we could have done something a bit cleverer to give them to something to think about. All we did was just retreat, 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 and basically we were smashing long balls. You know, at the end, desperation. And could we have done anything different? I mean, to be fair, it did bring on the Poitra and Mbenza, so he was trying to be offensive. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't put on. A, you know an extra defender and a midfielder so he was trying it just didn't come off did it no one of those days and they were finding their man you know everybody said oh Cardiff then were all over us well yeah they've got an extra man and they just happened to find them and they, the passing was crisp they were finding the extra man all the time and, and, and that the was chances. the only time when they actually started passing the ball because before that it was all a bit classic Warnock I think to be honest with you to answer that it was probably the wrong man to lose because Jonathan Hogg's mm. not a player that you would take off to change a game so he's probably an important piece of the jigsaw in, in the system whereby you know I'm, I'm not I, I think Philip Billings had a really good start to the season I think he's been a bit of a positive he's, he's looked a bit stronger he's done quite well but you would probably look at a Philip Billing you know if you want it sounds a really daft thing to say but if you want somebody to get sent off probably Philip Billing would be the least damaging in terms of you know being able to change things and switch things because Jonathan Hogg can press he can do it from the front Philip Billing's really good at intercepting he's got those long legs hasn't he and but he's positionally is a little bit naive still. Uh, he's probably got a little, you know, he's only 22 and start 32 games. So he's he, he will improve. I, I agree with what Reese said earlier. I, 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 the, the three in the middle don't, don't really work for me. And um, I think when it comes to this weekend at Everton, that ain't going to be easy. They've spent a lot of money again. And we're going in there as massive underdogs again, obviously on in awful form, especially after the cup defeat with Stoke. Um, but I'd just like to see us... The, the disappointment for me at Stoke was that we didn't see Town on the front foot getting at them. That that could have been a real season starter for me on on Tuesday and give us a real kick start. And we didn't, we, we just didn't get a grip a grip of it at all. So just to finish off the point about systems in Cardiff, so it for me it seemed that we'd gone a little bit too, you know, it, from transitioning from. Um, two games because you mentioned earlier about Birmingham um, being quite a key game which kicked us off we, we beat Birmingham 4-1 in the cup and then we beat Bournemouth 4-1 the next game since then at home we, we just seem to have the brakes on a little bit we're scared of committing men forward and my, my theory is that because we're a little bit slow in the middle of the park we, we tend to if we lose the ball we tend to have two men then running at us through the middle of the park and, it, and it's that sort of fear that we will lose the ball and have people running at us where it's going to hurt us which is which is one of the reasons why we're we're under committing at the minute, and one game which stood out when I was having a look at the stats was the Arsenal game when we played Arsenal. So we played a little bit of a different system there. And going back to something Lee Clark said many moons ago, where he says tactics don't win win matches, players do. And I think you know I'm coming up with too many quotes from Lee Clark right in the last yeah, few far weeks. Too many. <laughs> but I thought it is it's kind of an interesting point in that he's probably right. Players do win games, but systems do help you in games as well and against Arsenal we played a, a more of a 3-4-2-1 and we packed the midfield a little bit and Ince played as more of a uh, attacking central midfielder and it just gave us a bit more in the middle of the pitch and it allowed players like Moy I remember Moy hit the crossbar in the game from inside the box and it just allowed us to just move forward and have that cover and I just wonder whether that is I know we've signed wingers now but whether that could be a system which may be deployed a little bit later on I think we're a, a little bit slow as on a bit f scared of, of playing a ball centrally. There was not enough movement in and around the box against Cardiff. With Pritchard there, you've got somebody who's making runs, making moves. But if you've got Moy there, his instinct is to come back and to play it to Billing or to go wide or whatever. We had no forward ball. You can't, you can't bypass everybody and go straight to Mounier. You might get lucky, but we just had no movement in and around the box. So we end up going wide. I love us passing. I love us moving around like a chess set. I've got no complaints how we do that. Keep possession is fantastic. But if you've got no option in and around that box, and if you're not getting in that box with a number 10 buzzing about there, you're never going to get close to goal to get any chances. Yeah. You look at Man City, how they play it. They've got like three number 10s moving around and buzzing around. 
what happened to the style where we in the original style when we had the Pattersons and everybody just all three of them were just rotating yeah around buzzing there. around buzzing around yeah. and there were no positions and things really it was just a three behind the one yeah and even, and even the one floated in amongst as well. Absolutely. Then nobody, yeah, it wasn't an out and out striker no. all the time. That's a little problem. And I think against Cardiff City, and I, I'm David Wagner's biggest fan, and I'm as positive as anything still about this season. But I just thought that was slightly negative because if you're going to Oggy ostensibly sitting there and then you're just going to have Moy and, and Billing in front of him, they're kind of doing the same thing because it's Aaron's instinct to come back, turn, be safe. And yeah. Aaron works wonders. You plonk him in the middle there. And then he's got somebody, because we're going to have to, at some point, start to play balls through the middle, rather than him coming out the other side and then putting in poor crosses. Yeah. We knew what the problem was last year. Obviously, 28 Premier League goals, and there's little... Like I said, I hate to be a judge, we're not even in September yet, but there's little evidence, tactic-wise and, and kind of new recruit-wise, what we've seen, bits and parts, that, that's been addressed. And, yeah, we, we know we're solid, we're still hard to break down, but mm, it's, uh, it's a tough watch at the moment. So, we did go to 10 men. Jonathan Hogg rightly sent off or wrongly? Yeah, rightly. But I'd have sent Arch off as well. Did you see it? Did anyone see it? It was interesting to play. We were, we were on a rev of voyage, weren't we, up front? I think Dave, Dave like, Carby had broken. He got, yeah, we he were got like, wow, we're getting line. forward here. So, yeah. I don't think anyone saw it. But, yeah, in the modern day game, you can't, you can't do that, can you, really? I've seen it since. I think he was daft. I think he was silly. I think Arta was a better actor than me. Um, I think okay. they, they were both at it. And uh, Hogg was stronger. He is fit and he, was, he is aggressive. He just was on the front foot and he pushed him over. But boy, did the boy sell it and, and go down easily. You know, if you're going to send one off, send them both off. But he he, he got him sent off in, in, yeah, in many ways as well. Yeah, did. I'm not excusing him. It was stupid. He should know better than that. And we, boy, did we pay for it, really. And when it's your captain on the day as well, you're looking for a bit of leadership there in, in a game that is... <sighs> surely they've been warm before the game that Cardiff are going to be niggly, horrible, just classic Warnock Cardiff stuff. It's almost like a four-game ban for me because you had to write that game off and then we're out of the cup and then missing two big games against Everton and Palace. So it was um, bigger than three for me that... Right, so I opened the hog red card decision to Twitter. I, I expected it to be a deserved red card, and it's quite quite emphatic. So 89% say that hog deserved to be sent off. 11% disagree. Um, I did see a, somebody did say that both deserve to be sent off as well, just like you, Neil, which, which is, is a separate point as well. I, I, I don't think anybody... I, mean, I, I don't know who's voted that he shouldn't have been sent off because it's a, it's a blatant red. Right, so we'll move on now to other matters so Cossie there's a point you wanted to discuss as well which was there's a particular talk sport presenter who notoriously doesn't seem very keen on us with a little bit of history um, a guy that I refer to as Adrian Derwum because he's incredibly good at his job of rattling a few cages and getting people to ring in and I'm sure it makes talk sport a lot of money I'll be honest he's very very good at his job and he said on Tuesday, I think it was, Monday, Tuesday, with regards to Huddersfield, he said, they bought championship players Cardiff, so why weren't Huddersfield beating them? Why didn't it even look like they were going to beat them? When it was 11 versus 11, this wasn't Huddersfield completely dominating and creating chance after chance after chance. This was Huddersfield being terrible. It felt like there was almost an acceptance that, wow, he's performed a miracle in keeping us up, so we can't expect the same again. Well, you can. And maybe if you want to stay in the Premier League and become established in the Premier League, then it may well be, and this may well hurt because of what he's already done at the football club, it may be that they have to change manager. We know what he's about. We know he's a wind-up merchant. and uh, But I think he has a little bit of a point there. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not advocating a change whatsoever, but it got me thinking, would we have a better chance? It's, not, it's an irrelevant kind of argument anyway because we know he's going to be staying... Well, we think, you know, with Dean, but do you think we'd have a better chance of stopping in the division with a, a different coach? I can't believe I'm, I'm saying this, but I know he did it to wind us up and we know that, you know, there's previous between and us and it was in Durham. But and when you read some of that stuff, you know, it's almost like he's watched the highlights montage of and things and, and it's almost like he didn't realise we'd gone down to 10 men. But it did get me thinking only for a millisecond before I kind of got back on planet Earth. Could things be any different? 
with, you know, a new coach at the moment because things are, are tough. I, I understand the outside perspective looking at the start we've had. As an insider, any Huddersfield Town fan, any Huddersfield Town fan who is advocating a Wagner out, a change of manager, etc., needs their head read. That man in the last two years has performed absolute miracles. I'm not saying that everything's rosy in the garden. I'm not saying that everyone's enjoying it at the moment. But surely he deserves the chance to carry on the work he's already done. And somebody made a great point on Twitter the other day. I'd I'd pose this question about getting everybody built up and what have you and get everybody back into it. And, And somebody replied and said, maybe it's just that we're not good enough. But he added that, look at Burnley. Burnley weren't good enough. They got relegated. They kept Sean Dyche and they're now playing in the Europa League. So I think for people saying Wagner out, yeah, be annoyed, have an opinion, ask questions, you know, that you want two wingers, that you want two strikers, you know, be, be a fan, have, have the opinions like we all do. But anybody advocating Wagner out is crackers. I don't think he should be out, but and I think if you cut all that stuff, if it wasn't Adrian Durham, it was somebody else that was saying it and without all the guff about, you know, Saturday's game, it, I, it's an interesting point and, you know, fingers crossed we get a great result at Goodison on Saturday, but, you know, again, it's it's going to be interesting. You you want something to cling on to. You want some kind of things to really get behind at the moment. The only thing that's kind of keeping me ultra positive is just the start that we've had and the new starters we've not seen so be yet, but... It's kind of been a malaise that's kicked in from you know a long time back. I know we stayed in the division, and it's uh, yeah. I just think take the man out of, of who said it, and it is an interesting debate. Not that it'll happen anyway. Well, for me, first of all, David Wagner has earned the right to stay at the helm for the length of the season, come what may. I know that may sound ridiculous to a lot of town fans, but the man has earned the right. We were we were in the middle of nowhere three seasons ago. We weren't getting near the Premier League in the rest of my lifetime. And this guy has got us to where we are. He's made a fantastic job. And every time it's gone a little bit pear-shaped, we've given him a bit of time and he's turned it round. He's done it in two consecutive seasons, uh, the promotion season and last season when we've had slumps. And... There's always, okay, you get rid of your manager, there's a bounce on the whole. West Brom didn't have one, but there's a bounce generally. But it's, it lasts for some teams and it doesn't last for others. If David Wagner wants to stay with us, we have to think, again, long term. There's longevity here. You know, he's, 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 he's deigned to come and, 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 and stay with us another season when we all thought he might go. He, he's earned the right to stay. I personally think... We should keep calm. Everybody's kind of nearly writing off this season so quickly. I know those stats are not pretty, but there's other reasons. There's other things we need. To, he needs to look at. Give him the chance to look at them. You know, that spirit thing, you don't stay up on spirit, but it is lacking slightly. Losing certain players has not helped him. He's got to find a new hef in terms of who can grab hold of that team, take us forward. He will. I believe in him. I just think uh, uh, it's uh, talk sport is just playing devil's advocate it's yeah, nonsense to I me agree. so just picking up on a point that you mentioned there Reese, as well um, which I found really interesting is that in the promotion season in October we had a wobble we dropped from first to eighth I think it was the only week we were outside of the top six in the entire campaign uh, on social media you've got fans of other clubs posting little gifts with cars with the wheels bursting off etc mm. etc David Wagner turned it round. There's a Wigan game, Neil, you mentioned off off air, so to speak, isn't there? which was a bit of a tough tough one for us. He had another spell at the end of the promotion season whereby I think he reined it in a little bit because it's a small, thin squad which was getting a little bit tired. So before we went into the playoffs, we had a spell. Last season, we had a couple of spells and every time he's turned it around. And the frustrating thing for me, I understand people in the heat of the moment and when we do the post-match stuff, Cossie, sometimes it may get a little heated, but, you know, straight after the game. And after the game, people do get frustrated. They do want to vent. And I don't see anybody today calling David Wagner out after things have settled down. And I sometimes think we say these things sometimes in the heat of the moment. And then when you calm down, you look at it rationally, you think, oh, do you know what? He's done an amazing job over the last two years. We would be nowhere near the Premier League if it wasn't for him on a budget 
Again, we always gone about budgets, but a budget akin to Rotherham that season. He got us promoted. Rotherham went down, and the guy and and they say there's no loyalty in football, which is a, for me is a horrible saying because if anybody deserves some loyalty, he gave us loyalty in the summer by signing a new contract, Absolutely. and and Brilliant. to ask him to leave after three league games is just not something I think is is. Uh, I dare you. And 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 let's let's put those three league games into perspective first. Chelsea at home. Champions two years ago, more than likely one of Man City's nearest challenges this year. For half a game in that time, we're very good. The penalty killed it. We've lost three 0 Second game, we've come up against. Let, let's be fair. Arguably, the one of the top one or two teams in Europe at the moment. We've gone out there with a squad sort of depleted, changed, etc. Missing four or five key players. We've been pummeled. Fair one. Cardiff. <sighs> grim game reasons yeah absolutely but we got a point so two games where you're not expecting anything and then one game where you are expecting something so three league games in take the Stoke game out of it doesn't really matter now it's gone we're out at cup the end no point dwelling but we've got a point so that for me now it's something to build on and now it's over to David Wagner to do his thing and what he does best and people are forgetting that in that first game against Chelsea we came out in half time back of the stand and me and all my mates all talking about how good we'd been we were 2 nil down but we'd been good we'd taken that game to Chelsea at times yeah. you know uh, Kante shanked one and then there's a penalty given there oh, I think it probably was at the end of the day but just yeah. you know those fine fine margins for 20-25 minutes of that first half we took that game to Chelsea Mounier's rattled post and, and, and that could have been exactly I mean, it was probably nil nil at that time I think yeah. when, when, he, when he did that uh, we, we're one nil to them. Okay, yeah. sorry, but the, but we, we we didn't sit back, we didn't sulk, we went at them. It yeah. is in us. It is in that team to play well. We just got to flick a switch somewhere and get them back to where they were. You know, there's, it's not just one thing that's missing. We've talked about cross. We've talked about the way we might play. It's a, it's it's many many things. It's just an ingredient. It's just got to get it right again. Yeah. He, we, I believe he will. Many don't, but I believe he will. I don't think it's the results as a matter of fact I think it's just the excitement level that, that I think that's the thing that's fueling it we're coming in there and we're you know we're not seeing much excitement and it does go back to a little bit of last season I know it's an harder league and I know that but it is for me that is it I stood in my hands in my pockets at Stoke after an hour's play on Tuesday thinking we've lost there's no way we're going to come back and get you know goals back in this game and, that, and that's bad to think that I think just to finish on, on that point unless you guys have got any more on that one no. is when Schindler scored that penalty twas ever thus it was always going to be tough at some point there were always going to be these blips these things and Neil you put a great tweet out actually um, which got a little bit of traction um, about there were always going to be bumps in the road Yeah, and it's to be expected and one thing which a lot of town fans do really well is when things get tough they rally round and they get behind the team and they help the team get through it and that's what we did in the championship and it's what we did last season and it's what we need to go again the, the tweet that I put actually said I just put unexpected promotion unexpected survival not unexpected tough spells strap in because it might get bumpier but we just simply have to back the club the manager the players they've given us two epic years ask questions by all means but Wagner out and give over and it's sort of had over 300 likes so there's quite a few people out there who do agree with us and moving on to one club who did sack the manager last season they, they rolled the dice and they played us on Tuesday night in the championship from the championship was Stoke City they were an established Premier League club they rolled the dice they got it wrong they got relegated as did West Brom as did Swansea and you two guys went down there and I believe you were going to do a little bit of post-match there but that kind of fell through didn't it Neil with the car park shenanigans and whatnot. I got out of there quick after last year's <laughs> shambles <laughs> how did you guys find that game? you can go first Cosy. <laughs> well the first thing that kind of struck me was Stoke Obviously, we knew Tom Ince wasn't involved, but I thought, wow, that, that's quite an impressive lineup they've got. Which, and I'm kind of looking at, I'm wanting to see, I know we'd made six or seven changes and what have you, but, and I know, that, you know, they were a Premiership team last year, Premier League team last year, but I'm wanting to see kind of Huddersfield Town look the Premier League team, kind of impose themselves on the game and, 
didn't really see that. Uh, the one thing that stood out early on was Eric Derm. You know, his positional play, his touch, fantastic. Uh, and that was, you know, something really positive early doors. But again, you know, it, it was too, it was a pretty awful game, to be honest with you. But they deserve to win. There's no doubt about it. Uh, typical with the goal. Uh, again, slow reactions from the town players, you know, for the goal, for the first goal. And, and then when we would go behind, you're thinking, how oh, are we going to get back into it? Didn't see any of that. But I... I I just wanted to see more, especially from the guys maybe who haven't got an opportunity. But I get it's hard when you're just kind of throwing a side together. You know, that wasn't not played together. And I think one thing to think about on that goal as well is Christopher Schindler was down injured in back play, which yes, has caused, the, yeah, well, caused the whole... It, it, it was a video. very... it was a very. We've seen it a million times. It was a very, very town goal to concede that first one. Less said about the second, the best. is going to be on a lot of uh, comp- compilation videos over the coming years. It was a birthday present to years. me from Janino, was Yeah, that? it was an absolute belter. A 40-yard volley, own goal. But for me, I, I agree with Cos, it was uh, a frustrating one on Tuesday. With the highlight for me, you're coming out of that, you've got to try and cling to anything positive you can. And for me, it was getting 70, 75 minutes out of Eric Derma was comfortably our best player. He was, and uh, it, you know, it just makes you think. I know he can play a kind of right sider, but we seem to be, you know, spoilt down the left side. Congo are outstanding, obviously on on Saturday, but I'm looking kind of at the other guys, and again, it was similar problems. No one really had any, you know, service. There was nothing happening whatsoever. Stoke similar to uh, Cardiff, big, you know, cumbersome at the back. So you want something a little bit different, and again, you know, we didn't get that. Uh, Pritchard again, I just don't get why. I don't know. He's got I, I would amaze didn't start on yeah. Tuesday. Amazed again. It's so frustrating. And I know we we glossed over that a little bit, but the the most heartening thing there is that Eric Durham had a really good game, and he can play on the right hand side. And if you're looking at that, I mean, the way Congolo has been playing out there on at left back has been fantastic for me this this the start of this season. And we've got the makings of a very, very good back four if we can get Durham fit and on the pitch in the Premier League. If he plays at right back, Conglo at left back, we've got Zanka and Schindler in the middle. That's a very decent back line. It is, yeah. And, and something to build on. So that was really heartening that uh, Eric Durham showed up the other night. Let's hope his fitness yeah. remains. I know Flo Haddish and I has got a, a bit of a cult following, doesn't he, on Twitter. He's got quite a lot of fans. Um, I I would like to see Eric Dermot right back if he's, he's capable of doing so um, but just going back to again tactics and systems and Hogg, is, Hogg will be suspended what, does he miss one or three games? He'll miss another two, two now, miss yeah, another two. two okay yeah. so what we have is a lack of speed in the middle and we have a natural central midfielder a guy who's grown up playing central midfield who's only found himself playing right back in the last couple of years and, and to me doesn't really look like a natural defender in that position um, Are you talking about Hadajanai now? Hadajanai, yeah. Uh, forgive me, I didn't know he'd originally been a, a midfielder. Yeah, I know, apparently I know so, we yeah. stuck him in there. I was at Old Trafford and we yeah. put him in there last year. But and he would argue about our best player on the day. Yeah, as well. he was. That's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking now, is there an argument potentially? I know Danny Williams is back and it's great to see Danny Williams back after all the hard work you can see he's put in. And those player videos are great. It's great to see Danny Williams back, but he looked... In, in his time, yeah, he, looked, he looked rusty Tuesday. Potentially then, there's an argument to stem that pace issue in the middle of the field Flo Hadajanai is a quick player you know it, could he step in for Jonathan Hogg and play that role at number six it could for me without any shadow of a doubt yeah but I'd then like. for me you can't then play for me you can't then play Billing and Moy in front of him you've got to pick one of your two there you've got we, to have a, a Pritchard in, in, the, in that game we've got, we've got to see Pritchard get a start I mean he started the first two games and there. <laughs> They're the two games where he's not going to get that much chance to get ball and thread things. The next two games are the two where he's, you know, that's, you're expecting something like Pritchard to make you tick. So for me, he's, he's got to beat first name down on Saturday against Everton. I mean, we've not seen Sobe and Benson Diakabi from what we've seen, but I, I can't really judge these guys until they've got the ball running at a full back, you know, yeah. near the box. Absolutely. That, that's me when we can judge. Yeah, you know, I, I disappoint some of the writing that was coming out of uh, some of the papers, kind of saying, well, the new signings. They've not really had much impact, but you wouldn't have if you just like smashed the ball upfield. You know, you know, no chance of you know doing any damage as well. That it does worry me a little bit that you know we have got these guys in, so they must. I thought we might change the way kind of we played, but if that's 
other service they're going to get what we've seen so far then it's uh, it's going to be a torrid season for them boys I saw a few people not only a few in the, in the aftermath of the game having a bit of a go at Mbenza because of his because he, he struggled to get to the grips of the game but one thing David Wagner said is that when, when players come in they spend a little time in the classroom first to learn how we play yeah. and obviously when we've been down to 10 men we've, we've had a man sent off the game becomes more less well less structured it's more off the cuff and I think a lot of things for Mbenza probably didn't go very well because he's doing as instructed but because we've gone into a different a different compact shape it's it's thrown him a little bit so I'm, I'm interested to see more of Mbenza as it goes along and I'm not going to really comment on one game it, where it, everything's it did gone a okay. bit funny. At Stoke, okay, without setting the world alight. Probably had one of it. Uh, we were off target, but he had a, a decent shot at one point. He actually had a goal disallowed. Um, he, he stuck it away well. It was off, clearly offside, but he, he stuck it away well. But I'd like to see more of them. I think Bakuna, obviously, we hope, you know, he's become a bit of a national cult figure at the, you know, with the own goal. I don't, I don't think you can read too much into that. His corners were. Uh, well, I don't know who have been training with another team, but yeah, they were yeah, they were very heavy and looked very raw to be honest with you and that as well. And I think he's just gotta get that that's what disappointed me getting knocked out of that cup because you know, if you keep going you give these guys a chance for proper games against because they would say proper adults rather than the under, you know, twenty threes. So it's that were more disappointing to me. I wanted to see these guys get more game time and obviously that chance has gone now we're out. That leads on to another point. I'm gonna I'm gonna go a bit Adrian Durham here with with two questions as well, but hopefully not we too bad. We might fall out. <laughs> hopefully not too bad. <laughs> and, and one of them is, and I'm just judging this by people's reaction, and, and I have an opinion, but I'll let you guys go first. And is it should we care about the League Cup? Yes. Oh, you want more? Ah, yeah, go. For you it. want more? I can't just say yes. Yeah, but like Cosy's just said, it's a chance to get some of the lads who aren't going to play every week in the Premier League minutes on the pitch to give them a chance to sort of learn our identity in proper games rather than on videos on the training pitch in under twenty three games. And for me, we, it was an opportunity missed the other night a massive opportunity missed because that was a chance to after the Cardiff game they've clung on. We've got a point. Let's build on that. Let's go at Stoke. Let's get there. And for me, I. He's probably made too many changes for the Stoke game. I know you've got to give these lads a game, but I, I'd have probably just made three or four and still gone with a, a strong side and, and really had a, a, a real go at them. I mean, I, I agree with Cosy that um, it is a great chance to, to bed these players in. Uh, it's a pity now we've lost that. But like Neil said, um, this particular game with that particular start to this season, I think it might have been useful to keep the side together a little bit more than he did and to bed us in and to you know just get some minutes together yeah. on the pitch before we go to Everton again yeah. it's it's by the by now we, it didn't and you know so we take the positives which we saw Durham we saw Bakuna and we saw the rest of them given game time I, th- I think what what he's telling is last season at the start of the season f- f- quite a way into it you could pretty much guess maybe 8, 9, 10 of it was going to be starting I bet we'd struggle to name more than six or seven now who was going to be starting at Everton I just remember that Birmingham game again I touched on it earlier on but getting back in the car buzzing bring on the Bournemouth I think it was hopefully I've not you know got the game wrong there I kind of got back in the car on Tuesday night thinking God Everton you know lambs to the slaughter again it, again it's just I just think that momentum whether you believe it or not I just think we missed a trick on Tuesday and it brings us to the whole spirit thing again you know, we there is something slightly missing because of the new guys all being brought in, the kind of disjointed nature of that easily. Yeah. It just feels a little bit at the moment we're a little disjointed and, the, you know, we don't, don't have that spirit. As I say, spirit isn't the only thing that's going to win your games in the Premier League, but it's sure as hell missing at the moment and we need to claim it back somehow. So in, in the window, at the end of the window, we did our, our first podcast, didn't we? And we, we said we seemed on the face of things pretty happy with, with what we've done. In hindsight, opinions always change. And I'm not someone who's going to say, I've seen him Benza for 30 minutes, I don't like him or I like him. I'm not, I'm not going to jump on that kind of bandwagon. But in hindsight, Neil, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you first. Do you think we've maybe done the right thing in the transfer window in terms of getting in eight or nine guys, building a squad together, or do you think maybe we should have done more like Bournemouth did and get two or three players at a higher level, although we're not factoring in wages, obviously, which is probably the overriding yeah. factor. But should we maybe have got two or three key ones in rather than eight or nine 
squaddy players it, it's hard to criticise yet because the season's not got going for me um, the only one that I picked up on right from the start and I said it from the start is I still think we needed and we've picked up on it tonight I still think we needed another midfielder I think we've got Billing who's injury prone and liable to go missing at times full of potential could be anything it wants to be but as of yet he's not that player Johnny Og, we know has his limits don't get me wrong love Johnny Og. he built him in my team every week um, but also liable to get an injury Danny Williams been out for so long you can't expect him to come back hit the ground running he looked rusty the other night Aaron Moy as Cosy said a bit of World Cup itis looks a bit leggy and he's going to be going away in January for nearly a month so I think that's when, for me, another midfielder would have been start the season the time to get him. I don't think replace him in January. I think January is a it's a naff window. If you if you're going out shopping in January, you're getting a bit desperate to be honest. So it goes back to my other other question, which is a bit Durham esque maybe, is that we've had a chance to have a look at Alex Pritchard now since January. Do you think he was the right kind of number ten for us? When I when I watch him as a player, you, you see him pick up the ball and technically he's really really good, you know, and, and he's exciting. And then there are other times you watch him whereby we're probably not quick enough to support him, not quick enough to get there, so he gets bundled off the ball rather easily. Do you think maybe we we needed somebody like Casey Palmer, Izzy Brown? We had whereby they're quite strong and they can hold the ball themselves and support in the box. Or do you think he's I'll be completely well? honest? I, I don't think Brown or Palmer are Premiership level. I just, I just, I just that, don't not necessarily. That. Um, for me, ten million pound more. Yeah, and Pr- Pritchard, it just, it just hadn't had enough time in I the agree. team. It's been bitty. Yeah, it's almost fits and starts, and to start the first two in impossible games, to then not start in the next two that are winnable games, it's just a bit odd. For, for me, he's, he's got to start Saturday and it needs to be one of those where you're saying to him, right, you've got next 10 games, you're starting all of them and we're going to be going through you and working from you and just do your thing. He's a little bit tricky, like, because he said he can get us a free kick, can get us you know, a penalty. It, he's got to be in the team for me. I think it's as simple as this. For Russell Town, for me to have a chance of stopping up, Alex Pritchard has got to be used. They've got to get the best out of him. I think he offers something no one else can in, in the squad he worries me he seems to be on the periphery whether you know I don't know he's doing it training or whatever or Wagner's changed his mind but this guy's massive and I, I know we go back looking at certain games when players excel but that Bournemouth game you're not telling me you know that that was just class absolute class and Bournemouth were on a big roll going into that game what he does there we've got to find a way of getting the best out of this guy and I think we might see the best out of him when his two partners at the side of him either side of him start to click you know, when we've got three behind that central striker and they're buzzing and they're playing yeah. together and they're on their game. Alex Pritchard will be part of the three then, not just yeah. one on his own, who yeah. seems to be at the moment doing an awful lot and trying to make it happen. The only man making it happen for himself, really. Yeah, I agree. So moving on to the next part is, do you pick him this coming Saturday at Everton? Yes. Definitely. Absolutely. OK, so quite unanimous. I, I would as well, but I would probably maybe go back to a back five but go back to where we were last season in terms of more of a three than a five and I would have Pritchard slightly off off Mounier or departure it wouldn't take much for this season to erupt honestly can you imagine I've got my fantasy eyes on I'm not being drinking lads but can you imagine just somehow getting a late winner ever in front of that away and someone sliding and these lads all jumping on each other you know again, against all, a win against all odds that, we just need something like that because obviously fast forward a little bit Palace at home again that'll probably be a game where people well, we've got to beat the likes of Palace at home Saturday just excites me and that's one of the reasons why you know I'm, I'm kind of going because reality is you know we should lose but it just needs a bit of that to ignite it. So they made a good start, Everton. Um, they've looked quite impressive. You know, you, you're going about fantasy football there, Cossie, and I put Pritchard in mine. Hopefully that he was going to do something against Cardiff as well, so I'm not doing very well, sadly. <laughs> um, but Everton uh, are pretty hot with with fantasy team managers at the minute. They've got Toshin up front, who's, who's really sharp. They've got Theo Walcott, Richarlison should be suspended, I think, for his headbutt against Bournemouth, which is which yeah. is a plus. Um, Michael Keane got a bad injury, yeah, so uh, which is which is pretty bad. So obviously, obviously you wish her. Is Jackie Elka still out? I'm not he sure. He got sent off first game of the season, and that's a three, isn't it? So they've had two league games. Yeah, and, the and, court, a, yeah, and a, he'll be back, won't he? So, will he be back? Yeah, because he'll be missed. No, he's... Oh, the yeah. next two the and then the cup. Okay, yeah. yeah. 
So you start to look at maybe maybe this and you see there's maybe Everton perhaps aren't quite as solid. So they're not going to be able to name the first 11 week in, week out. So there's a few chinks there, the few things that they've got to replace with Charlison. And maybe we could catch them cold. I'll, I'll be honest, it's one for me where we've got to stop being sort of a bit scared of these teams. I know that's coming from fans as well. Just got to get, get out there, pick what we deem to be our best side, and get on the front foot and get at them. And whatever you get from them, you get. But let, let them worry about us. Let's get to a wide lads on. Let's get them playing fast. Let's get Pritchard linking things. Mounier de Poitre, take your pick. Well, everyone's got opinions on that. I'll be honest with you, I'm not bothered which one he picks on Saturday, but just pick Pritchard behind him. And I think there's something got to happen to Wagner as well. I think he's got to flick a switch because he's got to get rid of that fear he's had about these big big sides. We've lost that pressing game that we had when he first came in. We know that. And there's no better time than now to flick that switch and go... Right, let's go for it. Let's have a go at Everton. It's not Man City. It's it's not Chelsea away. You know what I mean? They, they are beatable. Yeah, I yeah. think we've got to get back to being positive. It cannot surely be as bad as last year's game at Goodison. I'm still recovering from that. that I think Casey Palmer's last game in a township, if I remember rightly, I think came on as a sub, but we were desperate that day. And I remember going there kind of different to that I don't know if we'd had a good result the week before but I was kind of going there with kind of a bit of optimism hopefully that would get at them and we were we were abject as well so it's quite telling as well I think I don't think we've sold out as we record this so again that, that's kind of interesting to me I don't know if, if it's just holiday season or people are just not feeling it like they were before but to me this is a game when I, I just even if we get beat boys I, I just want to see something you know crosses going in guys you know really having a go I want to walk out of Goodison, and win lose or draw just thinking we'll give it a good shot today Agreed I, the, 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 we need to show the front foot stuff we need to show the in your face stuff yeah they're a decent side are they world beaters no would I expect a team like Brighton, a Newcastle, a, I was going to say a Swansea, they've gone down, <laughs> um, a Southampton to go there and get something? Yeah, I probably would. So why can't we? Why, why can't we be that team that goes there and nicks a point, gets a last minute winner? You know, it's, we're, good, we're good enough. We've got, we have got good enough players. And I think all they need is that, like Cosy said, they need a bit of a spark. That moment, the season-defining, changing moment. But we've got we've got some decent players there. Don't you just think, though, and I know we're going about, we do need a little bit of luck as well. That about summed it up on, on Tuesday night. I don't know who edited it out. Was it Charlie Adam? I can't remember who. But that for that to happen to us, that just shows where we're at with the moment. You know, that we just need, a, as well as, you know, different mentality maybe, but just a little bit of luck. And, and I don't think we've got that. Obviously, you know, we saw it last week, Augie getting sent off. That that counts for a lot. So hopefully, Lady Luck, we can get that. And just being a bit bolder and braver at times, making decisions, you know, you think, OK, I might lose the ball if I play it into that mm. pocket there. But we've got to go for it sometimes. We yeah. can't just play safe. Or if you're, getting, if you're getting ball 25 yard out, somebody just hit it. Just have a go. Have a shot. Yeah, just have a go. See, the fans you never will, know. The fans will never knock that, will they, no, Neil? That's never. just it. And, never. And, and, you know, we're going back to them stats Matt read out at the start. Yeah, you know, just shoot. Give us something to get excited about. So I, I'm going on Saturday. You guys are, are all going. Yep. Yep. Are we going to do it? We should give it a go. <laughs> That's it. Terrier spirit. For, yeah, we've got to, haven't we? We've, we've got to get, get out there. And we just want to see... Re- for me, take the score out of it. For me, score on Saturday, we want to win, but it doesn't matter. It's all about the performance we put in. And we want to walk away from that ground, win, lose or draw, thinking that we're more like Huddersfield Town that we know. What I don't want to see is 35 minutes, the bar area absolutely packed with people just having a beer and giving zero interest to the game because that, that crept in in a few other games. I want to see no one at the bar area. Just go and get my beer, but just everyone's enjoying what they're seeing. And you'll be uh, post-matching as well again at the weekend, Cossie. If I can find Neil, yeah. So if anybody fancies getting involved with a post-match again, just remember, let us know. Send us a message on, on Twitter and we'll, we'll see if we can uh, find you on match days. So speaking of Twitter as well, so I put a, a question out. It was a bit of a sneaky one, I'll be honest. So I put a question out on Twitter, see if you guys know this. Um, but when you, when you come up with questions, you need to make sure that people can't always Google them straight away for the easy answers. So what I've put out is, can you name Huddersfield Town's first ever non-British player? And the winner gets nothing, by the way. I knew it what other day and I've completely forgotten. I just know he's South African. George Wynand. George Wynand 
is an acceptable answer. However, I cheated. <laughs> I, I remember him being on the final whistle video as well. He comes up on that on one of the two. But so a couple of couple of people have have come back and said. Um, Dave Oracle said this sort of thing always reminds me of George Donis which I apologise for because nobody needs to be reminded yeah, of George Donis, of George Donis. Um, Martin <laughs> Shaw um, said a Danish guy called Martin Nielsen who didn't last long I do remember Martin Nielsen I've been really excited to see him because he was not not British um, he I was can't, I can't picture him at all late he 90s bald, uh, baldy blonde and he kind of stocky midfielder played a little bit on the right he, what he naff <laughs> He, he belongs yeah. on one of those lists. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Huddersfield Town, 1908, or at Town Terrace is George Vinan, South Africa, 1937-1938. I said Vinan in honour of David Wagner. <laughs> hey, Vinan. <laughs> um, and someone else, Rich Senior, says um, George Donis, which, which is not the right answer. So, the, the way I've worded this is slightly sneaky in that, uh. can you name Town's first ever non-British player? And Ireland is not part of Britain. But Ireland was part of Great Britain until 1922. Somebody actually said Michael Collins, which is actually quite <laughs> ironic <laughs> in, a, in a way. Halifax is Michael Collins, but there was a Michael <laughs> Collins in 1922 who contributed to Ireland becoming an independent state. So, come on, get on with it. it? <laughs> I'm building this up. <laughs> yeah. So, it wasn't uh, James McCauley who was the first Irish player for Huddersfield because he was part of Ireland, was part of Great Britain then. So, Huddersfield Town's first ever non British player is 1927 to 29, and it's a player called Laurie Cumming. Good old Laurie. Missed the big three winning seasons though, didn't, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Not that good. <laughs> <laughs> Missed not, bus that lad. He made 19 <laughs> appearances, scoring or 21 appearances in total, scoring eight goals. So not bad. Right, cool. Yeah. Not bad. But got his <laughs> If you want to, <laughs> if you want to go the traditional route of the actual proper non-British and Irish player, then it would be George Vinand in 1937. So well done to those who didn't Google it, Reese. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Actually, I saw somebody who came up with that answer. I thought, oh, I'll have a look at that. I, and just, I, I just knew country, but I, couldn't, I didn't know a player. Yeah. I wouldn't have got a player. I can't lie and say that. He's I would played 28 times. So, Twitter. So, I've opened up question time on Twitter. So, let me dig out some of these questions. So, we've had a really good response this week. So, thank you again for everybody who's followed us and, and got involved. This will not be pretty. <laughs> this this is a podcast where we, we generally like to hear from other, other Huddersfield fans and we like other people's voices. So, I really do enjoy the um, interaction. Sick of ours. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, at, the less we talk, the better. So, um, coming for some questions. So. Some of them we've already covered, so thanks to Freddie Cocker. Um, Freddie is a middle-class East End boy who I speak to a little bit on Twitter, and I do like Freddie. Um, I do throw in a few Mockney accents to him, which I'm sure he appreciates, and he's very polite about as well when I do. Um, l covered a little bit, but he says, can we afford to play a midfield three of Moy, Billing, and Hogg when teams just man-mark Moy and Billing, and Hogg have failed to, oh, sorry, Billing and Hogg have failed to deliver creatively so far this season? Plenty of time for them to improve. Anybody want to cover that one? We've kind of covered that one, haven't we? We have a little bit, Freddie. I I would prefer to see a, a number 10. I think we've covered that one. I think we would all probably prefer to see a number 10 involved, a more natural number 10, and yep. that isn't Aaron Moy if we do push him forward. No, no. So I'm avoiding Stu's question. Thanks for that, Stu. And there's a good one here from one of our uh, original podcasters a, um, a very fine fellow by the name of Danny G <laughs> who will be back on next week uh, he's got a question for our oh, but it's for me yes it is a question for our <laughs> debutante Reese Dinsdale thank you Danny and he says Reese, having experienced I think that's in brackets as well having experienced both which paints the bleakest most depressing outlook on life Thread's depiction of a nuclear winter in which the human race struggles to cope in the aftermath aftermath of a one megaton warhead attack on Britain or down at the max post-match reactions. <laughs> I'm saying nothing. Um, yeah, don't uh, don't go on down at the Mac at uh, five o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Um, 
listen, everybody's entitled to their opinions. It's it's fine, uh, but um, it can be a it can be pretty frightening. I think what you've, you've got to remember these days now we're in the, the Premier League every game's on a stream so it's not like before where you know the people who were either at the ground or not most people are watching the game so you are getting more opinions and because they're not down at the Mac and Twitter so yeah everyone uh, has watched the game I'll be honest I've had a lot of fun on that forum in the past with some good people I've met Absolutely. people from there as well so I've met Great Neil people. you were on there and I think I, I met you met Pozza through that and me and Pozza um, had one of the first Cowshed Loyal meetings back in 2008 because we, we met on there and I met a, a great guy on there who used to post called Fitzy Blue who was one of my all time yeah. favourites and yeah. he sadly passed away in 2014 yeah. and he was a really special guy really on there. Good, so yeah. there are some fantastic people on, yeah, on the so site actually to balance things out. Whereby we yeah. do poke fun at it sometimes but it it has been a great source of yeah. Of, uh, of Huddersfield Town news in the past and uh, we do dip in and out every now and then don't we for a little uh, yeah we'll be honest it's 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 good value um, so Elliot and Freddie the talk of the town chaps uh, have also been in touch as well um, Elliot the relentless machine wheat Boeing says also along these lines uh, with regards to Olaf Rebbe so we've not really heard from Olaf Rebbe interestingly so far usually we get an, a, an interview on YouTube don't we and I'd be really interested to see what he's about and stuff, but Elliot said... If he'd like to come on the podcast, we'd be more than welcome. <laughs> he would. So also, along these lines, would Town have been better off spending big on fullbacks with known end products, such as Marvin Plattenhart, who was uh, in the Germany 2018 World Cup squad, uh, left wing back, rather than spending big on wingers when wingers seem superfluous in the system that Town use? I would say we have spent big on fullbacks in the... Congolo can play and does play and plays well at left back at 17 million quid and we spent wisely on Eric Durham if he can come good this is a World Cup squad player winning squad player so we've got two fullbacks in, in there we've only a certain amount of money we can spend yeah. I think we've done pretty well if they come if, if Durham can come good I, I would throw in as well that uh, thanks for Elliot but I would I would throw in as well when uh, net spend Castle United tend to start chirping about money spent on transfers, etc. One thing that they conveniently miss is the hundred million plus wage bill that they've that they've been carrying, and net spend uh, transfer fees are not just part of the figure. Um, someone like Marvin Plattenhard, I think he was linked with us with a twenty was, million yeah. pound move, but he also comes with hefty wages as well to compensate for him being a current German international and. And that's something that we probably can't. Realism's got to kick in. Like that, that's the that's the long and short of it. And I don't think any of us um, saw the Congolo coming permanent. I didn't see it to be honest. And and have we paid anything for Durham? I think it's a, nom- it, it's a nominal a fee, million or two, whatever that is. A it's million balance yeah. things out. Isn't yeah, it? but I think I saw one million banded about, but I don't know how true that is. Uh, so Tom reen has been in touch as well. So thanks, Tom. Um, Tom says uh, thoughts on why we've covered these a little bit but thoughts on why Town abandoned the philosophy and tactics which got Town noticed in the first place so Tom here is going on about really uh, the lack of you know pressing which we do it's a fair point I think we've all got the same concern but what I would say against that is um the quality of the op- quality of the opposition we're coming up against, which is yeah. vastly superior to the ones we came up against in the championship. Yeah, for me, if you if you press half the teams in the Premier League now, they skip around you. It's a lot yeah. easier to press a team in the championship with sure. with midfielders of similar ability and, and speed than what it is to go up to the Premier League and have even the lower teams. You've got Crystal. We we'll use Crystal Palace who are coming up shortly. They've got Milivojevic in midfield, who's, who's a fantastic midfielder who yeah. can play higher. They've got. Uh, last it was, year it was also probably on fifty, sixty thousand pound a week. Yeah, and they've just given Zaha one hundred and thirty grand a week. And yeah, you know, if, if Zaha wants to skip around you, if you press him, you, it will. You, it's almost like pressing a suicide button. So yeah. it, it's we've obviously had to rein that in a bit more because there were games where we were just getting ripped apart through the middle. Um, and I understand where Tom's coming from. I think there are probably certain trigger points, and Gagan pressing is is more about trigger points. You know, what triggers the press and what area and what what situation triggers the press and we do appear to have abandoned it almost completely and I get why but I think Tom's probably right in that there are probably situations and triggers whereby we could do it again but thanks for that Tom 
Um, so Andrew Griffiths as well has been in touch and says uh, what would you change for Everton and why I know it will never happen but I'd like us to go back to basics with a 442, possibly and Benza off Mounier somebody to hunt down any lost cause with pace basically but without losing the aerial presence of Mooney. I think Andrew's going for more of a 4-4-1-1 there if he's playing off him, and which is similar to what France did in the World Cup. With, it's not going to happen. Let's be honest, it's not going to happen. Wait, wait. It'd be brave going with two sort of flat midfielders to give the two wide lads licence. It wouldn't actually make that much difference to how we play now, if we're being brutally honest. I think that's it, what he's kind of describing there is probably not too dissimilar from a 4-2-3-1 anyway in, yeah. in terms of if, if Mbenza's playing off Mooney I think what he's saying is uh, and maybe what I've alluded to a little bit with Pritchard is that he, he wouldn't mind seeing someone with a bit more speed behind Mooney to chase around and, and cause a bit more problems yeah. so it's an interesting Mbenza's point Mbenza's played there hasn't he he, he has played across he can I think play he's played team. across that three for I yeah, think Pierre Carby as well I think they can both yeah. play which I think is Either what I was or. saying. Oh, he's trying to try and get back to those three revolving guys behind the yeah. central striker a little bit more if we can. I think bravery comes into that as well again. Then yeah, I think we've been a bit too cautious. Is probably the word. I mean, he just moved that ball just a little bit quicker. Wouldn't it? His speed of yeah. thought we're lacking slightly at yeah. the moment. We're just not thinking quickly enough safety not being first. brave enough to it's play those first. balls sit, like, just a little bit that's all it, it feels to me There's it's like little... you're right it's, you, you're right it's what we've alluded to earlier that's why I say a switch about when, yeah. that's just the thing it's just like saying let's just take the shackles let's just be a little bit bolder it's yeah. not changing how we play and all the no. rest of it just doing things maybe daring yourself to do it a little bit quicker yeah and, and make that pass that you you had that chance that split second and a you little bit play more that ball, we'll play it I'm not, it I'm not advocating long ball by no saying it, by direct being a bit more sort of incisive is probably the right word rather than direct going forward a little bit quicker hey listen if Man City can play that ball to where are they oh. <laughs> we're allowed now and again That's a we tried it ball. the other day and they fell over each other yeah. virtually <laughs> Mooney went offside didn't they um, right so Gary Paget's uh, tweeted as well and he said if you've got Reese Dinsdale on can you ask him regardless of age any point in his career which htfc.com legend would you have liked to play in a film or play <laughs> that's a good question uh, unquestionably uh, be Frank I, I would say Frank uh, yes. without a doubt <laughs> I enjoyed that both on and off the pitch um, actually I, 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 I met Frank Twice. I, 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 in recent years, I had dinner with him and about 20 other town kind of legends when Jeff Heady, um, the ex-town chairman, had his 70th birthday and invited 20 of his friends and people he'd worked with over the years to a dinner at, um, at uh, what's the place up at Emily? Three? The, 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 Three the, Acres. The Three Acres. So yeah. the 20 of us sat around this table and Frank was there, regaling us all with stories it was all about Frank all night long, of course. Yeah. Um, but so I did make Frank. But the, the funnier one is I I, uh, I met Frank when I was a young actor um, in uh, Birmingham. I was just straight out of drama school doing some uh, a play at the Birmingham Rep. I was in a, doing some Shakespeare, and uh, I went into the toilet, and in this nightclub uh, over the road called the Rum Runner, rather famous uh, place where the new romantic movement started. Um, and there's me and Frank having a pee in the urinals against each other. <laughs> me and Big Frank. Peeing, and, uh, peeing against each other? Or? And, uh, just <laughs> either side. Uh, and, uh, and then we were at the, uh, the, 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 the uh, sinks washing our hands. And I, I chirped up because I, he, I hadn't done any work then. I was just straight out of drama school. He didn't know who I was. And um, I started saying to him, I'm, I'm a big town fan. Frank, how are you doing? And he must have been playing, well, he was playing with Birmingham City at the time. Um, and he'd been to South, I think they'd been playing in Southampton that day, and this was about 12 o'clock at night, so he got back and he's straight in the club. So he was chatting away, and I said, oh, I saw you playing this team, and that team. And, uh, and he got interested, and he got to start talking to me, because I was an actor and all that stuff. And then finally, but he said, uh, so what, what actually are you doing? I said, well, I'm over at the rep here doing some Shakespeare. And as soon as I said Shakespeare, he turned on his heels virtually and left. I just thought Big Frank and the Bard <laughs> were the best of bedfellows. Shakespeare wasn't his thing, I don't think. So. Go away, play. I'm not ever been an actor, but 
if I could have put myself in one position and people would be saying Schindler and people would maybe saying Chris Billy or what have you but Jonathan Ogg at Chelsea last year not just because I wanted a body like his with that top off but <laughs> it was just a beautiful thing for anyone who saw the video he's on them advertising audience yeah. job done in front of the way singing weekend, his song singing his head off absolutely unbelievable we all know his song yeah that, if I could have been anyone for a day for the moment that was it what a moment so following on from that Reese, one thing that we did in the first episode was we, we tend to reminisce a bit about our first game my, my first game was 1989 against Mansfield when I was a little kid Neil yours was in the year I was born 1980 yeah. against Sheffield United um, and Cossie yours was a few years later or a glory fan no our uh, Bradford City at home 19 you were, I think you know this Neil, New Year's Day 83 New Year's Day 83 six, six, six goals we got promoted uh, Brian Stanton that back season four. and I thought that was going to be how it were always going to be your all time hero Neil absolutely I love Brian Stanton can you remember your first I can uh, not a great lot of detail about it but I'm uh, I'm a lot older than you boys. Um, <laughs> my first game was uh, the 16th of December, 1967. Um, we were at home um, to Bristol City. Um, my dad took me with my uncle Eddie. Uh, we sat at the back of the main stand at uh, Leeds Road. Um, and all I remember was being overall by the, the smells and the sound of the crowd and, and the greenness of the pitch and if you think about it December 16th the lights would have been on yeah. the grass would have been green we played then in the old blue kit old blue shirt yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tom Johnson with the white trims yeah, absolutely um, we lost 3-0 and it still didn't put me on that's how we start that's how it should start yeah I, I absolutely with abject it. failure yeah, absolutely <laughs> yes uh, not but it was it was amazing, and um, then we I, from that point on we kept coming. Um, my dad had been obviously my granddad was lucky enough to have seen the great teams in the twenties, um, and then he took my dad post war, Brilliant. and and it's been a family thing. And now I take take my son Luca, and he's just I mean it's unbelievable. You know he's he's been watching us the last four or five, and he's a minor info. Yeah, oh, he's a man. He's my little encyclopedia at the side of me. You know, I just sit in there and I don't. I have a terrible memory. I barely remember lines. And he and he just sits there and he, he tells. He fills me in with the details of who scored last game, who plays for who. Brilliant. He even knows which town players room with other town players on the. You know, Brilliant. he gets it all. So I, I love I love these stories because I'm I'm a fourth fourth generation Huddersfield fan. So my uh, great granddad was wow. um, was there in the 1920s. As wow. well, you know, he yeah. he was the one. He was the one who saw the good stuff and then passed it on for the rest of us to have nothing for the next <laughs> eighty years or whatnot. My, my my dad's parents weren't interested in football, so my dad took himself. He's actually from Durham originally, my dad, and they moved down here when he was young, and he took himself to Bradford Park Avenue to do mentionables yeah. to Bradford, and then he had one trip one day to town and just stuck. And I think they yeah. lost the day it went as well, but it just stuck. So. We all, we all remember that, don't we, when we walk. I, the first game I went to was in the cow shed. I just remember, I still remember walking down the steps and you see the sun yeah. shining on the pitch and the floodlights and you just sit there and you just think, or stand there and you just think, this is for me. I remember this back, is back, at, back at Old Terrace, you'd, all those steps up, yeah, yeah. which I'm bad no being crucified with them now. And then <laughs> just the open expanse and I also remember the excitement at half time waiting for him to turn boards round yeah. for half time scores. You used to have to buy a programme so the you knew the end. scores. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The A, B, C, D, F, G yeah. on programme, and then you wait for him to do it, and then you find out in Carrant Way they were completely wrong. <laughs> and whether it's because of that first game being in floodlights, I still get, I still love night matches. We all say that, don't we? But night matches are just. There's like, a buzz. A real the, there's a bus, and I think that's what drag me and tick out of the night. He's yeah, gotta go. It's under yeah. lights, but it's just uh, we love it. Yeah, and I think that takes us back sort of to where we are now, and people sort of questioning Wagner and maybe wanting a change. And you look, you look at we, we've all seen more, <laughs> a lot more bad Days. than good. Yeah, and I think when you've had a promotion to. Premier League we've had a season of Premier League we're in another one now let's just enjoy it if, I we, mean, go, if we go down we go down but you've got to have something to enjoy I, I, no I agree I with that I get that Neil I agree I'm, with I'm, that I'm, I'm, I saw a few tweets going the other way saying well hang on a minute I know what we saw before because I'm a good one for churning out what about this player or this moment and, you know when we lost at Macclesfield and all that but I just think it is I, I want to be excited I, again, I fully understand the, the need to be excited we all want to be excited yeah. by it we all want to go and enjoy it and we've spoke about that tonight and you know, I'm I'm one who 
question coming out of Stoke the night whether I'm going to even go to Everton on Saturday and I'd, go, I'd already got a ticket change your mind I'm going to Everton on Saturday of course I am but I don't think going to the Championship is the option I had a really interesting uh, debate in the gas club this guy you know said I'd rather be top 8 Championship battling for a promotion than just existing no, and con- no exactly and I, it's, it's almost like yeah and you ask any Stoke fans we were drinking a couple before the game they were saying God it's uh, you know make sure you try and keep staying that Premier League because this is this I'll, tell, is I'll tell you what it's it's easier to stay in it than it would be to ever get back in it. Yeah. For every Burnley, there's a Norwich. Absolutely. And a Sunderland. A and a new, and a, yeah. And you name them. And even Blackburn. Wolves had to go. I mean, you know, yeah. me and Man City, you, go, you can keep falling, can't you? Blackburn, you Forest. Leeds. <laughs> you don't look too far. Bradford went all the way to the bottom division. So did Swindon. Swindon. All the way to the bottom division. Now. Oldham. It's just managing people's expectations. I, I find it hard enough managing a 14 year old's expectation but that's allowed he's 14 yeah. you know he's had it good and it's great and I don't yeah. mind that but it's hard you know we, we lose one and he, he's upset and that. but when we're trying to manage 35 year old people's expectations and things it's it's hard and 45 and, enjoy your match and 55 and you just want to feel you've got a chance don't you you just want to feel yeah. you've got a chance I even deluded like a lot of their games last year I, I you go to Anfield I think oh Come on, we've, you never know. Man United. Well, let's at be the honest. Moment, it, I'm just thinking. We're nil nil at half time at Old Trafford. You're thinking, yeah. Are we going to get that one chance no, today? Are we just going to get that one? It. And you never know, do you? That's why we got. That's why you watch football. Yeah. Let's hope we can reignite it on Saturday. Yeah. So, the last three questions. So, Thomas Furbank, thanks, Thomas, for yours. Um, we've kind of had the same thing about um, why we've stopped playing high, high pressing attacking football that got us here, and we do think it's a bit of a lack of confidence at the minute, and as well as a conscious effort to play safety first um, but here's a good one Neil I'll, I'll, I'll put this one for you because it's come from your mate the German Ben Thorns <laughs> oh god and these are the, I, I listen to a, a, a rugby league podcast I'm, me and Costi are rugby league fans out we for our sins and there's one rugby league podcast which is which I find superb which is called Whippets and Flat Caps and it's done by John Wilkin uh, professional John Wilkin Mark Flanagan and a BBC um presenter called Will Perry and some of the questions they have on there are very very funny which I won't repeat on on this one but they're really good and this kind of goes a little bit along those lines and as is your mate I'm going to give it to you Neil Um, which is more appealing six months of Fat Sam manager in Huddersfield Town or being eaten alive by insects whilst impaled upon a barbed wire fence (laughs) appealing the latter Uh, 100% 100% the latter I'm actually going to Everton with Ben on Saturday God (laughs) okay so last question from uh, Michael Casey Michael's um, I like Michael's picture his arm his arm's about the size of both of my legs put together he's he's, he's a bit of a Lauren de Poitras style unit Michael and he asks about Olaf Rebbe I'm going to paraphrase slightly um but he's he's asking if there, if we think there's any disharmony between Wagner, Rebe, and Dean Hoyle on signings, and maybe we've gone for the second best signings. Oh no, not um, a clue. The only thing I would say I'll is that I'll be honest, we don't know, and I think it's as well we don't know. The the only thing I would say is that don't always trust who the media link you with because we no. were linked with Triori for eighteen million. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were linked with Limbombe all summer. Um, and people are kind of uh, not Michael especially but I've seen other people saying we've not been able to sign our the main players we wanted but Dean Hoyle said we but the chairman's debunked it yeah so don't always don't always believe what we get linked with maybe don't always believe the chair right? <laughs> <laughs> I think I like, it's interesting keeping that one in <laughs> we've just done it earlier though the, the wide it's interesting that I don't know was it, was it a tweet or a question but we've signed a lot of wide players for system I think it was you mentioned it Reese, wasn't it got a lot of wide players in for a for a system that doesn't encourage wide players which is a strange one but obviously early days we almost said that last week didn't we so they, they almost play as pivots don't they for the full backs going forward and they're playing yeah. those little half Drop spaces in. Yeah, but he's overloaded that left side it would appear we may be very wrong we don't know what he's got in his yeah. mind but you know with VLP with uh, Sobi you know with Lerva with um, Congo Derm. with D- Derm possibly you know he, had, he did get rid of um, uh, your man who's got the derby um, Vince Scott Malone. No, Scott Malone. I missed oh, that Malone, song. Yeah. Great song. Um, not so much the best. But so yeah. it seems a bit strange that there's the, the, the what we brought in, but ours is not the reason why, I suppose. Yeah, just a special request as well. If anyone from the club's listening who plays the music, the Michael Effley song needs to be consigned to the I, dustbin. I, I tweeted exactly the we same need thing to, last yeah, night. Because I just think it just brings back memories of... You know, we've got to move on. Yeah, we've got to move we've on. We've got to move on. Yeah. It, need, it needs a, a new beginning. Do you know like that? 
No, no, I don't. Not that video. Not, not, he don't want to be on repeat three times before no, we kick yeah. off. He's gone. Mm. He's gone. He'll forever live in Uddersfield Town legend without any shadow of a doubt. But that song does need to go. And you knew last night when you settled down to watch Nottingham Forest Newcastle, you knew it would have a stormer, just a few more fire, and you knew Joe Lolly would have a stormer as well, didn't you? But we need to move on, these guys. Championship players, characters, or what have you. But yeah, let's get behind the lads we've got now. Absolutely. I, I, I agree, but I also look at... Um, Man United and they still sing songs about Eric Cantona and I think that's quite cool as long as it's got, in the I, right I ain't got a problem with them singing about context. town fans can quite happily pull out an Effley song <laughs> yeah, exactly. on 75 minutes but as a club we don't need to be hearing it as the build up tune to a game that we're about to watch it needs to be banished fancy a little bit of Northern Soul well, I've got anything. That, that Congo anything. song, they've managed to get that, but it's so slow, isn't it? I think they need yeah. kind of a modern version of that. I don't know who's, Reese, you might know uh, who sings it, but yeah. It's Pilot, it's isn't it? Yeah. Pilot, I think yeah. it's a band called Pilot from the 70s. I shouldn't know these things, but I do for some reason. We've already got a new one out with a dear Carvey. Love it. What? What is that? I saw Ollie tweeting about that. Oh, God, do you want me to sing it? Yeah, ooh, yeah. Dear Carvey, ooh, ooh, dear Carvey. Oh, it's Salt and Pepper, isn't it? Do, yeah. do, do, do. <laughs> we just need him to get a goal to I'll never forget that first time that Tommy Smith uh, song got sung and we were like, what are people singing and we just sung it loud and loud and even scored that day so I think we maybe need some of that I, I quite like that there's, there's also a new Aaron Moy song doing the rounds at the minute which hasn't caught on which is in the style of oh. Half the World Away by Oasis it were awesome though in, in the Weatherspoons and that print works before the game it were erupting with that and Man City were trying to sing the Blue Moon, but it was just like getting nowhere. But yeah, it is a bit of a long song, but I just think anything to get behind these new guys, we need to come up with Bakun and get his spirits up on. Just need to think what some of the songs might be after Tuesday's goal. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's it for this week. So thanks to everybody that's got in touch. Um, really appreciate the feedback so far and, and, and a, a, you know all positive and negative, more than welcome. Um, if you guys ever want to appear on any of the post-match, uh, please get in touch with us and we'll be more than happy to have uh, a lot of people on. And thanks, Reese, for coming in. Um, don't be a stranger. You're welcome back any time. Thank you. Enjoy this. I've enjoyed myself. Might have um, talked a lot of old rubbish, but I enjoyed myself. <laughs> Fitting the treat then. <laughs> that's it. And that's, that's all what we've got for this week. Thank you very much. Is this the moment for Lee Fowler? It is. Take your place in Division 2, Huddersfield Town. He's missed. Steve Simonson clears the flame of the goal and collapses in a heap of tears. Pete's got a chance and he scores! Jack Pete scores! Heffel is in there! Schmidt scores for Field Town! 3-2 Town! For a sherry, Danny Ward saves! Danny Ward saves! The quack was in, round the hair! 2-0 on a field town! Christopher Schindler! Oh, and a chance to write his name in Huddersfield Town legend! And he takes that chance!